All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, there won't be as many people in this one as there was last week, and that's kind of anticipated. Um, I'm not going to be able to do a robotic repeat of last lecture because I'm human being and that's a physical impossibility. But I sort of thought this one would be a good opportunity to go over it again because I think there's a potential for people to see the process again and maybe answer their own questions. And I have no doubt that if anybody tried this, there's probably a likelihood that things didn't go exactly as planned because of some scenario that is likely to occur or even unlikely to occur. So I wanted to go ahead and just do this process again so that we can clear everything up, make sure that we're all set to go, and then we'll start moving on with different lectures as we go. Um, the uh, current plan for next lesson, uh, next Friday, is probably going to be something like going through all the settings in Pro. There is a lot that we can configure. There's a lot that you can configure separately. There might be different needs within the Bureau based off of your role that would dictate different settings and things you'd want to be aware of. So I thought I'd just go ahead and go through all of the settings in um, uh, the settings options in Arc Pro and just kind of outline what each of those mean. I don't know what all of them mean, like in absolute detail, honestly. I don't know what some of them mean in general. Um, but the reality is, is that most of the ones that I have played with and found utility in are kind of the ones I'm going to go over. And that then leads us into, you know, actually then starting to work in Pro. Um, I'm debating whether or not the metadata topic will come up sooner rather than later. Um, there's a uh, kind of an idea of maybe covering topology things as well at some point. There's lots on the table. And then again, as always, your questions will help um, sort of dictate the path that this uh, uh, series goes. Uh, this is meant to be, you know, for all of you guys to uh, be able to ask questions and figure out processes and maybe learn from some of the things that we've figured out over the years and all of those types of things. So um, keep showing up, keep asking questions, watch the YouTube videos, ask questions on the YouTube channel. All of that's fine. Um, this video will be posted to the YouTube channel just like the same, uh, just like last week. I will add it to that same informal lecture series playlist so that there's always a consistent place to go and hit these videos so that you can actually catch up on them, watch them, rewatch them. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the software update thing again. We're going to kind of go through the same things that we did last week in case people missed or there are questions. And it also gives me the opportunity to establish the expectations amongst our users that when we open ArcGIS Pro, if you happen to see in the upper right hand corner a notification that says there is a ArcGIS Pro software update available, that means that there is probably a new release, a new major release, a new minor release, or a new patch. Please do not update this yourself. Everyone should currently be on 3.2.1, and we want to keep everyone on that same version for as long as possible, or at least long as um, responsible. <laughs> um, as uh, bugs are found and things like that, patches fix those things, so we may be required to go, but we preserve the interoperability within the Bureau. The key thing, the most hard principle on this to remember is that three, two, one. Currently, we're in Arc Release Pro Major Version 3, Minor Release 2, Patch 1. The key thing to take home is don't go beyond three. Don't go beyond a major release. That will absolutely introduce an incompatibility with sharing your um, projects with your coworkers and collaborators. If we do happen to get a minor release that goes 3.3, again, I would request that you refer refrain from doing that until maybe some of us in the GIS group have had time to go ahead and vet whether that does uh, it, there is no compatibility issues. And then for patches, you know, the patches aren't the worst thing in the world. If you were to happen to do the one of those accidentally, it wouldn't matter in the grand scheme of things. We're probably fine with that, and your interoperability would just work. It probably wouldn't create any issues. Esri says that it will not create issues between patches, minor releases, 
but there is compatibility issues likely with major releases. So it's that first number in that, in that set of numbers that is the important one to make sure that we're all on the same page. If you do happen to update things beyond that and it starts creating problems, let me know. We will um, reinstall the version prior or the current operating version that then prevents those interoperability issues. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is I've opened up Arc Pro. And like last time, this is going to be extremely similar. There might be a few things that I'm going to discuss slightly differently because I recognize um, uh, some issues that I may uh, have brought up unintentionally. Last time I said, when you open up ArcGIS Pro, it always opens to the splash screen. Okay, that's not entirely true. There is a setting that you could uncheck and it won't show up on this splash screen. It'll start with a different screen. Okay. Generally speaking, it will open up to this splash screen. So if you are somehow missing this, again, we'll talk about settings next week. It'll We can go into the settings uh, options for Arc Pro and reconfigure it so that this splash screen shows up. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but that is one of the fundamental things that this lectures, I mean, right from the get go, that's where we start is on this splash screen for uh, comprehension and communication and understanding. Um, so we open, we're going to start without a template because what we want to do is import a project, a MXD into Pro as a project. So we're gonna go ahead and start without a template. What it does is it opens to the insert. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. It opens to the insert of a uh, tab ribbon interface. And on that, we have the import map. One of the questions that was brought up last time was, is import layout and import map the same thing? They do very, very, very similar things. So I don't think it would matter in this case, which one you pick, but import layout has like an extra function where you can load in a specific layout configuration that you wanted to work from. Import map does a complete import of everything as it exists. So if you didn't have a layout, you could pull one in from scratch and pull in an MXD. In the grand scheme of things, import map works. Both of these would work in this functionality. So that is one of the clarification points to discuss. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and use import map. What this does is it takes the data from the MXD, does a conversion to it, writes all of the files that are required for an Arc Pro project, and gets it figured up to operate in this new paradigm. Uh, so all of your layer file properties come in, the layout settings come in, data reference locations in your layer file properties comes in, most of the metadata for the XMD, uh, MXD will come in. There's a few things that do operate 100% perfectly, there are a few things that do not operate very well, but there's not many of them. Um, so that will be one thing to pay attention to is if you start getting little warnings and stuff like that along the way, pay attention to your notifications as those come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and navigate to the MXD that I want to load in. And it is this Taylor Well MXD. That's the example I'm going to use. So when we click import map, it pulls up the browse function to navigate to the MXD we want to import. We select it and we click OK. What that will now do is do all of that math and well, not math, all of that uh, process function to convert the file to a pro project format. Um, while this is loading, this is the perfect time to discuss exactly this function. The time it takes for this to load and convert from an MXD to a pro project will depend on the number of data frames, sorry, map frames the number of layouts that you have on a map, the complexity of the data, the joins, the relates, the complex symbology. If you're relating to enterprise databases, if you're pulling stuff from the cloud, all of that, just the more of those things you have, the more time it will take to process this. When we're talking about one of our geologic maps, uh, it doesn't take too long, but as you can see, it's not an instantaneous process. But it is pretty quick in the grand scheme of things. I probably should have restarted my computer because every time I've tested this, it's usually done by now. So I guess I should have restarted my computer before this lecture. Either that or I'm talking faster. Um, okay, so now 
once we load this in, everything from that MXD that could be converted comes into this uh, project environment now, into the ArcGIS environment. It will always open up to the data. Sorry, I had to make sure I said this right, view. So we're, sorry, the layout view. So now we have the layout view open. Each of the maps in this layout view are in here ready to be opened. And we'll go over that in just a little bit. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about is getting things kind of pre-set up to be able to save this in a way that makes sense. In the settings, in the Arc Pro options, one of the things that happens every time you open up a new project is Arc Pro builds you a default geodatabase. Most of the time, you don't need a default geodatabase, especially here in the Bureau with the way we do things. We provide you that geodatabase. You don't need Arc to build you one. You need to point to that preferred given to you geodatabase. So one of the things I'm going to do right off the bat is I'm going to switch to my catalog and I'm going to come to my database and sure enough we see that my home geodatabase, my default geodatabase is a geodatabase titled default geodatabase. And one of the things that we can do on this is we can remove this so that we don't have to deal with it again. The only problem is we can't remove it from here. We have to add in a day we always have to have a default geodatabase. So before we can remove what is currently the default geodatabase, we need to add in a replacement default geodatabase. And in this case, we do. We want to pull from our Taylor Well geodatabase, which is in our folder in Map Elements Arc sitting right here. So it exists, it has data in it, it's reading from it. We want to point it to this. So what we want to do first and foremost is right click on databases. There's, as with everything in ARC and has always been, there's always five or 10 different ways you can get this functionality happening. One of the easiest things to do to add a geodatabase is come to catalog, open the databases folder of your project, right click on the database and say add database. This will add an existing database to your project. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that navigate to my Taylor Well Map Elements Arc folder, select my new, what I want to be the added geodatabase that we will make the default geodatabase and click OK. Once we get that in, now we can switch the default geodatabase from our default.gdb to our Taylor Well. So we right click on it and say make default. This sets this as your home geodatabase. So no matter what, anytime you run a geoprocessing step, anytime you try to do some functionality, it will try and use that default geodatabase by, oddly enough, default. I don't know how many times I've said default and geodatabase now, but if anyone's running a count, that would be amazing. So I've gone ahead and now made my default geodatabase. Taylor well, and I'm going to remove the default geodatabase from the project. And it's fairly simple. Notice I am not saying delete this default geodatabase. I am removing it from the project. That is a different functionality. It doesn't go away. I remove it from showing up in this project. At this point now, it'd probably be a good idea to go ahead and save this pro project. And part of the reason why I'm going to do that now is because I'd like to show you that default geodatabase, show you where it shows up, how you get rid of it, and all of those things that occur with working with a pro project. And when we look at this, I'm going to save it in here in this folder so that we retain all of our connections with things. That will allow this project to work more universal with our existing folder structure. So I'm going to put it in here. And now I want you to pay attention currently to the number of folders that are here. And I'm going to go ahead and select the files and we can see that I've got 21 items in this project. And I want you to see what happens when we save a pro project. We don't get the 22nd file. We get more than that. So what we want to do as well is to use the existing folder structure to save this project, we have to save it kind of a very special way. So what I'm gonna do is come up here and click the Save Project button. 
When I do this, it asks me where I would like to save this. So I'm going to navigate to that TaylorWell folder, Map Elements Arc. And here's the trick. Because I want to use this folder, I have to name the project the same thing as that folder. If you name this TaylorWell, I would get a TaylorWell folder inside here now. So it would be TaylorWell, Map Elements, TaylorWell. That is redundant. We want to use our existing folder structure so that the project has a place to live. And so our documentation and all of our verbiage that we've used all over the years stays the same. So we have continuity between Arc Map and Arc Pro. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and save this project as Arc. We'll see that the title up here becomes called Arc. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close this down so that we can see what functionally happened. In here now, instead of 21 items, instead of 22 items for adding the Arc Pro project, we now have 27 items. This, 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 and this. There should be one more, there it is. All came in as a byproduct of saving that project. And the reason why we wanted to do it this way is so that we get it in our project, our project in our folder structure as our folder structure already exists. So there's a few things that we'd wanna change right off the bat. We wouldn't want all of our pro projects called ARC. That doesn't make sense. So what we need to do is come in here and change the name of a few things so that we can then name them appropriately for the Bureau's naming convention. So this would become TaylorWell.APRX. Now we've got our TaylorWell project. In here, we can also see that my default geodatabase came in, but I removed it from the project. It doesn't matter. Anytime you make a new project, it builds you a default geodatabase. That's a somewhat little bit of a lie because there's two options, uh, but we'll talk about that. We, we may talk about that next week's. But this default geodatabase now doesn't become beneficial to us. It, 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 it's, it's, no, it's not a useful function for us when we have a proper geodatabase for our data to go into, as well as a scratch geodatabase for all of our temporary uh, uh, intermediate steps of geoprocessing. So um, this time, I didn't show this last time. I went ahead and just left it in here. In this one, I'm gonna sh physically show you the delete process. So you right click on it and you delete it. Now it's gone. Um, now that will not show up in that pro project ever again. And it won't be an option for you to select because we've removed it from the project and then we removed it from here. Now, there's a gotcha that I think is gonna happen on that, but I wanna see what happens when we actually open that project back up. It's likely that it'll show up in our databases again, but if I click on it, it's probably gonna show a broken link because it can't find it. And then all we have to do is remove that default geodatabase again. So now that we're here and we're renaming the uh, the Arc Pro project, the APRX, we might as well rename a few things. So this is called Arc Index because we named our project Arc. So if we go ahead and open TaylorWell APRX, it's going to make an make a TaylorWell underscore index file. We can prevent it from adding another file into this and making the total back up to 27. We can preemptively let our project know what the name of that index file would be, it has to match in order for this functionality to happen. So if I were to misspell Taylor well here or here, they would not, it, ARC would not understand that that's the index folder that goes into. The other thing that happened is in the process of working up that untitled project before we physically saved it, it preserved that index information that came in with that project as the untitled index when it was named unti un untitled. So we can go ahead and remove that one as well. So I delete that one from it. Now I'm at 25 files. We created an import log. We created a default ATBX and an APRX. And we have our Taylor Well Index. So 
Now we're back at 21 files if we subtract those four that we just created. And when we open this project now, we've cleaned this up and set this up so we don't get any extraneous files that we don't know what to do with. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the TaylorWell APRX, check my notes to see where I'm at and make sure I covered things. And now we have our Taylor Well project open. Whatever your map title name is, now it's open. Um, I see there's a question in chat. You do not have to remove the default geodatabase, but you will never use the default geodatabase. Um, you should always build yourself by design a database for final accepted approved project data to exist in. And then a scratch geo database to put temporary files in while you're working on things. Uh, intermediate steps. If you've got a 10 uh, geo processing long step, you should put the nine of those in the default in the sorry in the scratch geo database. And then when you make that final last step file, that should go in your actual default geo database for the project. Does that answer your question, Ginger? Maybe. I have a question too. Oh, oh okay. Um, are, uh, okay. Um, let's find out whether we answer Ginger's question first. Okay. I'm confused on on why we've got to do all this and all this, but I don't think now's the time to get me unconfused. Okay. So the reason why we're doing all of this is just to get the project imported and cleaned up. ARC dictates a process to its users that isn't exactly uh, coincident with the files and the way we use things in uh, the Bureau of Geology. That process of building that default geo database, we have no control over that. Pro does that for you. But you almost every project that we work on here in the Bureau has a database, a geo database that the data is going to go into. So we now end up with two databases that are project geo databases when we only really need one of them, the actual pro projects geo database, not the one that Esri decided the project needed by default. Um, okay, that kind of makes sense, thanks. Yeah, it just does it by default and we have no control over that. And again, that's kind of a not entirely true because there's some things we can do in the settings, but it's not perfect. But that is just functionally what happens. Just like the index file, we have no control over that. That is a script that runs that build that is built when we convert a map to a project or when you make a new project by default. All of these things just come in because Esri assumes incorrectly for you that you don't know what you're doing. Okay, that's a little oversimplification for it. They give you the default geodatabase so you can put data into it. When really you typically have schemas and stuff like that that you want to apply to the geodatabase. So, you know, it, it, it's here's the thing that you can put things in. Well, I don't like that container. I want our container. And that's all we're doing is we're just swapping containers. Okay. So um, luckily enough, uh, because I deleted it, uh, normally I had seen an occurrence where occasionally that default geo database, when I come back to catalog in the project databases folder, that default geo database would show back up. If you click on it, it pulls up a red exclamation mark, meaning it's a broken link. It can't find it. Well, it doesn't need to find it. We would remove it from this project anyway. So now we only have our Taylor Well. Uh, geo database. We should go ahead now and add in our scratch geo database as well so that we have that temporary location to write generic intermediary fi intermediate files to. The other thing that we should do is we should go ahead, our Taylor Well geo database is set to be our default geo database. We have the, there are scripts and tools that run in Arc Pro that write temporary files that we don't have control over and most scripts actually go through and delete those during the process of creation 
but we can also specify where those temporary files get wrote and we as GIS users typically have temporary files as well. So what we're going to do is specify our Scratch Geo database. So what we want to do is come to Analysis, Environments, and we can see that our TaylorWell Geo database is the default Geo database as well as the Scratch workspace. So what we would like to do now is go ahead to our project databases and we've since we've added Taylor well we can select it from our project databases because we've added it to the list we can select it uh oh why is that not working There we go. That was bizarre. Did everyone see that? It wouldn't let me select it. Uh, 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 we have an interesting issue that just occurred. But anyway, I clicked it again. I went and had navigated to it and was able to select it. And now I can set it as our Scratch Geo database. Click OK. It locks that in. Clicking Save then saves that to the project. Okay, um, Dan, that's right. You had a question. Yeah, it's a simple question, but uh, I noticed when you brought your uh, opened up uh, Arc Pro, it went to layout mode. I, when I did mine, it didn't do that. How do you how do you switch from layout mode or view? I guess you say to like what would be called data view in Arc. Maybe? Okay, the reason why it probably came in into map view is because your project doesn't have. Oh, sorry, in. God, this terminology is going to get frustrating. Um, so this is layout view. The yeah. MXD that you imported, did it have a layout? Yeah, or it probably didn't, actually. Yeah. It didn't. How I could it either. switch to layout view if it didn't have a layout? Yeah, okay. That's the reason why. So I, I hate to, 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 to I, I didn't mean to sound pedantic there. I, I was generally trying to help you make the connection yourself of the why. How, how is, would I put it? If, I, if it's in layout view uh, or data view now, how do you switch it to layout view? We'll get there in just a second. Okay. Yep, we'll get there. Okay, so, because um, literally it's absolutely the next step because what we're gonna do now is go through catalog project and go through all of these folders and show you what they are. So the very first one is maps. So Dan, how do we get to map view? We would go ahead and select the map view that we want, double click on it, and we open up map view. So that's how you get to map view. Okay. Again, as with Arc, there is five ways to do everything. So if we go to our layout view and we don't remember our catalog project maps folder, we can navigate in the table of contents. This is our layout. We're gonna look for the map view that we want to open as a map view. So here's my, let's pick the geologic cross section because I've already got the geology up. Here's the map view. Again, that icon is your clue that this is a map view. If I go ahead and expand it, right click on the map itself. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Right click on the map itself and click open. This will also open the map view of that in that project. So there's lots of different ways to get there. I can open the correlation of map units by double clicking it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's a way up here in the ribbon to, that's a new map. I feel like there's another way up here somewhere to go ahead and open a map as well. Um, and in here, you can see all of the different maps, map views that are in this layout. So currently we've got the correlation of map units, which is this one, the cross section, which is this one, the geologic map, which is this one. And then we've got our quad index and our state index. This is kind of one of the nice things about, um, Pro as well is you'll notice that if I close these, I never lose them. I always have access to them over here or in my layout and vice versa. 
because if I go ahead and close this, this is going to be silly, but, oh no, how do I get anything open now? It's all gone. We have a layout folder as well that we can reopen the layout. So this is why we're going over this now is because nothing is ever really gone now. It's very convenient to navigate through things and not worry about what is open, what isn't open, what you need. You can always jump back and forth between whichever you need to, map view or data view. Now, I'm not going to use data view because we're going to call these layouts and we're going to call these maps. Um, so we're going to try and replace the map view, data view discussions with layout views and map views. Okay, so the next thing is toolboxes. If we ever had a um, bureau-specific toolbox that was limiting the number of tools that everyone needed for, say, generating a geologic map or something like that, we could build a toolbox that is smaller and more nimble and only has the scripts and tools that you need to be able to build that geologic map, for example. So instead of having everything that's in a, I'm not going to open the toolbox, but you know, the, 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 fine, I'll do it actually. The everything in the world that's in a toolbox, we could limit this down to a specific number. And uh, Ginger, this comes back to your question as well everything gets that default thing from the get-go. Whether it's a toolbox or a database, it builds by default those specific functionalities in there. So they just come in. That's how that works. It's how ARC is telling us to function. So the toolbox comes in by default. If you wanted to add another toolbox, again, right-click on the folder, navigate to add toolbox and go ahead and add in that separate toolbox. So in the map production group, sorry, the GIS services program, we have a gems toolbox. We have a cross section toolbox that we add into many of our projects. So that's the toolbox. Databases, we discussed this as well. Sometimes there's gonna be a third or fourth database in here that you may need access to. There are some things that you could um, want that you could need. Another possible option is you've never created the Scratch Geodatabase. You can right click and say new file geodatabase and build that Scratch Geodatabase for your um, Scratch files to live in. Uh, we also talked about the layout. So if I want to, I can add a new layout. I can do whatever I need to this layout. I can go ahead and add maps to a layout. Map frames, sorry. Oop. Sorry, I'm doing that poorly. Insert. Map frame. And I can insert a map frame. in this new layout. It mirrored the size of the layout that exists. And this is one of those areas where import layout may be more functional than just right clicking and adding a layout. You may wanna actually build a layout or import some other existing layout. This would be how you could get that function in. Okay. Oop. And then the other factor is if you ever are satisfied with the layout that you've built and you're ready to delete it, you can go ahead and right click. Is someone's mic open? Sorry. Okay. Um, you can delete anything in here. Here's the discussion between uh, remove from project and delete. Remove from project just removes it from this project's existence. It'll still be in your folder structure. Delete literally deletes it from existence. So if I go ahead and delete this layout, I can never get this back. Are you sure you want to permanently delete the selected items? Yes, I do. I can never get that back now. It is gone. There are times where I build temporary maps where I just do some geoprocessing in with the only the data that I need to. And then once I'm done with that, I go ahead and delete that as well. Okay, one of the other things that we have that each project has is a, uh, uh, um, a style file. So by default, Esri keeps all of these 
default style files loaded in. The Bureau of Geology, we have our own specific style file that we use, so we can right click, add a style. This will also allow you to import Arc map styles into Arc Pro and save them as a STYLEX, a style X file. Currently, these are just style files, so I'm going to go ahead and select that one. Click OK. Now I've got my gems uh, style file. The part that's kind of nice about the style files now is if I double click on one of these, it will actually open a catalog view in our main window to be able to look at the properties of our style file so that we can see all of the existing styles that are pre-configured for different features, different symbology, different labeling functions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is also Sorry, I'm drawing a blank on where that is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, um, on different tabs, these are content aware based off of what is open. And that's the reason why I was having a hard time finding this is if I had a map open, I'm pretty sure I know, yeah, insert, there it is. So I was looking for it over here, but in catalog view, it's over here. It shrinks in because of the content aware functionality of these uh, different views. You can also import a style. So we've got multiple ways of getting these things in. I'm gonna go in ahead and import in the Taylor Well specific style file. We double click on it. It'll eventually show up here and here in that file once it's done updating. In that view, sorry, I said file in this view. So there it is. Again, we click on it and we can see the specifics of this style file. And as well, because we've got styles, we've also got folders. So in here, we can predefine some of these things. One of the things that I recommend predefining is, let me rephrase that, in your folders, it will always start with the arc folder. It gives you the project folder 100% of the time as one of the project folders. I have set it up so where that T data sets, where all of our base map information is, lots of reference material data is in, and our state map, my typical working directory, uh, my typical uh, um, uh, reference directory is what I should call that, always shows up in all projects. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and remove my S drive from the project, and I'm gonna show the process of adding a folder and also adding it to every project that ever exists from this point forward. So if I go ahead and say add folder connection, navigate to my S drive, click okay. Now it's in here. If I right click on that, I can add it to new projects. This adds it to every new project that I create in Pro. That guarantees that no matter what, I will always have these two in every single project I make and my project folder as well. Okay, now that we've gone ahead and set these all to defaults and we've got our uh, uh, ARC folder, one of the other things that I commonly do is there are times where I need a different file. So this is the project, this is the publication project folder. In there is more files that we typically need when working with GIS. And one of the most common things that we need is our rasters that are ancillary items or reference material or field maps or something like that. We occasionally need to pull those in. I can't navigate there to here. I can't navigate to there from here because I only have the arc folder and I need you know, two folders up. So what we can also do is right click, add a folder connection to that root folder that I'm looking for. 
to there's that root folder for the publication project. I'm gonna go ahead and open that. And now I have the access to get to those files in repository rasters from here now. So we've added in the functionality. This would be a good one to keep in this project, absolutely, unmistakably. So now we can access the main root folder as well as just the ARC stuff folder, the, the GIS specific folder. The problem with this discussion is I have now indexed this folder multiple times here. Did I do S? I must have done S. Let's try that again. No, I didn't. There we go. So this is what I was looking for and expecting to see is this home folder showing you that these two are the same because you can only have one home folder. So in here, we can now see that this is indexed once and indexed again. That is one of the things that I recommend and caution you about when adding folder connections. The more folder connections you add, the more likely you are to re-index multiple things, the slower your software uh, will operate. So the more connections you have, the slower the software will operate is that take home message. Try to keep this lean and light for expedience and easy to find things. That being said, I can't tell you what folders you're going to need access to on a regular basis. Just keep in mind that we're trying to keep that as lean as possible for uh, the software to function as quickly as possible. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and save this project and I can go ahead and start working on whatever it is that I need to start working on. Okay, one of the next things I wanted to cover is a precursor to the next discussion that we're going to go into, and that is settings. So, in if we go to project options, we pull up all of the settings options that are available to us in our software. Some of them are specific to the project, some of them are specific to the application. The one that I'm going to comment on, there's a few that I'm going to co comment on here. One of the ones that I'm going to comment on is in your project settings in the units. One of the things that I know is most of us use as Muthal compasses. So by default, ARC projects are set to quadrant bearing. Most of us don't have quadrant bearing runtons. Most of us don't write down things in quadrant bearing notation. Most of us use North as Muthal. So I wanted to show you by default how to, not by default, but wanted to show you how in each project you will have to set this to North as Muthal because this is a project setting, a current project setting. So the next project I open up, unless I've saved this project with this setting, it will default back to quadrant bearing. So be aware of that. Also, I'll comment that the azimuthal notation seems to be a little bit easier to type in when you're typing in values that you want things to rotate to or you want to create a direction on. It just makes things a little easier. So I wanted to touch on that one. And then there are some application specific settings that we can go into as well. Like how we start ArcGIS Pro, or whether or not we're in dark mode in our application theme, which I am currently. And if I switch to light mode, I can't do it automatically. It gives me a warning that says it requires me to restart the application, so I'm not gonna go into that. But we have the ability to switch to a dark mode, which is easier on the eyes. Um, the other one that I wanted to talk about is project recovery. One of the things that's nice about Pro is that we now have the ability to create a backup when the project has unsaved changes. It will save this backup after a five minute interval has elapsed. So now we've got backups. If ArcPro crashes, we only lose the last five minutes of the changes we have saved in our project. There are very similar functions for when we're in editing as well. We'll get into those probably in more detail uh, in uh, the next lecture, but I wanted to talk about one of the gotchas that we should be concerned with and or make note of. 
When editing in ArcMap, you always had to go to your editor tab, click editor, start editing, do your editing, and then editor, save edits, editor, stop editing. Now in Pro, by default, when you switch to, uh, when you open Pro, by default, you are always in an editing session. Meaning, and I don't mean this to be rude, but you are dangerous from the word go. As soon as you open up this project, you can start manipulating data. That's kind of risky because we are kind of uh, uh, entrained with the logic that we have to start an editing session in map. Now, that being said, if we open the editing settings and go to session, we can enable and disable editing from the edit tab. Checking this checkbox turns on the editor start editing function again. So you have the ability to save yourself from yourself if you're at all concerned with that, you definitely have the ability to check this checkbox and set it to make it to where you have to turn on an editing session before you can start editing data. And that would be this one right here, enable and disable editing from the editing tab. I don't know how many of you have also ever worked in ArcMap and you're digitizing and you've been digitizing for 30 minutes or three hours and suddenly Arc crashes and you haven't saved your edits in a while. You now have a, a an assistant in Arc Pro. It will automatically save edits at a time interval of 10 or you can set it to number of operations. The downfall of this and the warning that I can provide to this is, again, if you leave these as are, you are always dangerous by default. And if you make line changes after 10 minutes, it's going to save those line changes whether you wanted to or not. So that is something to be aware of when working in GIS now, whether you're working on data or a layout thing that you are always in an editing session unless you configure it to do so, and you will always automatically save unless you tell it not to. So that is one of the gotchas that I wanted to just preface right off the bat and make sure there was full comprehension on because it is one of the very explicit things that is different from ArcMap to Arc Pro, and it is one of the ones that could be potentially dangerous if you aren't aware of it. Okay, so are there any other, th those are the topics that I wanted to cover, and again, I was able to go through that just a little bit faster than last week, um, but is there any questions that people have with regard to the process of importing uh, MXD into so that it becomes a Arc Pro project?